Hi, I'm Robert Veal from Limelight Arts Travel and welcome to this introduction to the history of Venice. Now, since I graduated from the University of Sydney in Italian language and literature, I've been teaching about the history of Italy and specifically Venice for more than two decades. At the same time, I've been leading tours uh, throughout Italy, particularly to Venice and also other places uh, in Europe. Um, so this talk is designed uh, to supplement uh, the experience of people who are traveling on uh, tours with limelight arts travel that go uh, to Venice. Um, however, you might have come across this talk uh, just browsing through YouTube. Um, you're very welcome uh, to watch and I hope uh, you enjoy it and learn um, a lot about Venice's history. Now, people come to Venice for many different reasons. Some people love uh, the art, some people just love the beautiful setting, um, some people play it, see it as a a party um, city or a place to relax and just uh, enjoy the finer things of life. Whatever your reason, um, you're going to be hit uh, with an, a wealth of uh, visual information when you hit the city. And uh, it covers um, 1500 years, perhaps a little longer, if you look a bit more deeply um, of history. And as you're walking around any district of the city, you might find yourself um, coming across, you know, just in a single um, glance over a thousand years of history with different periods, different styles, different influences. And it can become very, very overwhelming. So the purpose of this talk is to look at the broad sweep of history um, to break down Venice's long and glorious history into some distinct periods. And hopefully that will make it easier and more enjoyable and more rewarding when you are actually in the city and looking uh, at, at uh, the different uh, sites. Of course, there are many different ways of looking at Venice and considering its history and enjoying its culture and its heritage. This historical way in is just one way in. And indeed, this talk is supplemented by a number of other more specific talks which cover different periods, specific periods, and also different aspects of the city, such as its painting, its architecture, um, aspects of the mythology of the city. So sit back, um, strap yourselves in, because we're going to go through over a thousand years of history rather quickly uh, to give us an overview of the history in this particular period. So first of all, I'm going to break down, uh, in fact, more than 2000 years of history into seven bite sized chunks. Now, of course, historians love doing this. They love uh, identifying changes that happen over time in the history of a country or a place or a group of people uh, and identifying and describing those sorts of changes and then labeling those as different periods in history. Of course, history doesn't unfold in this particular way. People don't wake up one morning and perceive that they are in the Renaissance and everything changes. Historians come along later and put these labels on. Nevertheless, the labels um, often stick and they're a good way for us to get a heuristic and an overview um, of the history. So I've uh, broken down, as I said, 2000 years plus of history uh, into seven bite sized chunks. So let, let's go through some of those. One of the most interesting periods, um, one of the most difficult to access visually uh, in the city, but an absolutely uh, important one is the prehistory. So the lagoon, which is Italy's largest wetland, it still has migrating birds. It's a very distinct um, landscape, a very beautiful landscape, stark, but beautiful if you go out on the lagoon. Um, in fact, a lot of northeastern Italy, the region we know of, of the Veneto, had a similar sort of marshy landscape of, 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 of lakes and channels and birds uh, and you know low um, forests uh, on the very flat land. Um, today that's retreated a bit to the lagoon, but it's a, it's a unique and actually quite delicate um, ecology. And it's into that setting that people first um, settled uh, way back before recorded history and actually set many of the patterns that we can still see today that we come to identify as being typically Venetian, this sort of living half on water and half on land, which characterizes the uniqueness uh, of the city is something that goes back a long time. The best way to enjoy this uh, is by taking uh, a trip in some way, in some form, out into the lagoon. Uh, it takes you away from the hustle and the bustle and the crowds of the center of Venice, um, but it also visually takes you back in time and you can see what an unprepossessing, quite harsh uh, environment the lagoon is and, and how miraculous it is that this glorious city, the head of an empire, a maritime empire, emerges uh, in the lagoon, rises out of the lagoon, as it were. 
When we get into recorded history or early recorded history, we can see that what we see is the modern city of Venice begin to take shape. So initially scattered settlements, then we can identify communities living around the lagoon, and we'll have a look at that. Uh, and then they begin to coalesce in one set of sandbanks, in particular, the high bank or the Rivo Alto, which of course today we know as the Rialto. This is an important early part of Venice's history. The historical records are there. We have political um, accounts, that is records of the transactions. We have accounts written by other groups of people who were interacting uh, with the Venetians. So we know something about them, but it's scattered compared to the later history. Of course, Venice wasn't the powerful and important city that it became uh, in this second period that I've identified. Uh, and it is, in a way, um, a period that's full of myths and legends as much as it is of recorded factual history. And sometimes, uh, coming from Australia, I liken this period uh, to the dream time for Indigenous uh, Australian um, people, the way that uh, stories, which are sort of partly historical, um, but often there which are explaining uh, either social phenomenon or natural features and things like that, uh, they begin to emerge uh, as a kind of proto or pre-science of the area. So uh, pay attention to some of the myths uh, in this particular area. It's important, but we actually have, of course, uh, some uh, important physical uh, and material things happening uh, in this period. Uh, so places like the Doge's Palace, St. Mark's uh, Basilica, and other buildings actually begin to emerge um, during this early period. Of vital importance in the city that we see today and underpinning really everything about Venice that makes Venice significant, uh, important, beautiful uh, as a city is this incredible explosion, uh, economic, uh, political explosion that takes place from the beginning of the 11th uh, century right through to the early 16th century. And this is these are the centuries that really put Venice on the map. This is when Venice ventures out from the lagoon, uh, controls uh, the northern Adriatic, eventually the entire Adriatic, and comes to take over all of the trade routes uh, which were previously the preserve of Venice's colleagues, uh, the Byzantines, based in Constantinople. So as, as Byzantium weakens for a whole range of reasons, Venice rises up. This is when there's terrific technical innovation in shipping, in navigation, in chart making, uh, in commerce, in the way that the Venetians organise and do business, such that during this period, everybody in Europe, which is also undergoing a boom, by the way, at this time, absolutely everybody um, starts to come to Venice. It becomes seen as a good place to do uh, business. Venice, of course, in this time has to change its political structure. All of a sudden, it's gone from being a, a, a set of communities to a city which dominates the lagoon, to a city which dominates the Adriatic and then eventually has a huge, very wealthy maritime empire. So all of the institutions of Venetian government also evolve and emerge uh, in this time. It can be quite tumultuous um, at, at, different, at different points uh, in, the, in the history. Some of the great sort of political stories of Venice's history um, come from this period. But overall, it's a history of remarkably smooth transition, thanks to the unique political structure that Venice has that emerges at this time, which is a mix of monarchy, uh, an oligarchy and a republic at the stage. In fact, of course, the structure of Venetian society, the political structure, is something which has long fascinated visitors and historians. And that's certainly the subject of a separate talk. We can identify following this sort of period of enormous um, growth, a period where Venice really begins to assert its power and prestige on the rest of Europe. Uh, and so we can see the dates from about the 1450s uh, through to 1631, which is the last uh, major outbreak break of the plague in Venice. Now, I've used that date 1453. This is when the Ottoman Turks take over Constantinople. So things in the east are changing and what was Venice's main source of wealth and political power, which was the control of commerce with the East, that begins to change. 
At the same time, Venice decides that it's going to acquire a land empire, and it does this in the 1420s, 30s, and 40s. This is the area that we know as the Veneto today. So as soon as Venice moves from being a maritime empire to having um, the terraferma, as they call it, it enters into the sphere of Italian and European politics. And so Venice begins to um, use some of the visual style, the Renaissance style, which has uh, emerged in uh, Italy 50 or 60 years earlier. And it begins to project through diplomacy, uh, through building, uh, through artistic patronage, uh, these values. It begins to project these uh, back onto Europe. Um, we see this particularly if we look at the art of Venice in the 16th century artists, such as uh, Titian in particular, but Tintoretto and Bellini, these become the leading style uh, in, in Europe. We see industries such as printing, uh, which is enormously important in Venice. Venice really leads the way uh, in these ways. Venice imposes itself uh, at first politically, but then culturally on Europe. Um, and even though business is not booming perhaps in the way that it was in those early centuries, um, Venice is really projecting an image or images of great glory um, through its ceremony, through its power, through these displays that it puts on in this period of time. As I said, culturally, it corresponds um, with the European and the Italian Renaissance. So we have a coalescing of the Renaissance style and this particular desire um, by the Venetian state to glorify itself. Uh, that does tend uh, to come to a rather dramatic crash in the 17th century, and there are a few things uh, that bring that about. I mentioned the plague of 1631, um, killing perhaps a third of the city of Venice. Can you imagine what that does uh, to the economy uh, and the society, having that uh, level of depth? At the same time, in Northern Europe, uh, where just the Thirty Years' War is getting underway, and this really uh, changes the focus of many of Venice's major trading partners. And Venice itself is fighting a losing battle for its empire. The Turks are becoming more and more militarily, militarily active and aggressive, uh, and uh, they are taking many of the territories which uh, Venice had previously acquired, most notably the island of Crete, which was Venice's main possession uh, in the Mediterranean. And after a 50 year war in 1669, that falls uh, to the Turks. That's the beginning, of course, or the continuation uh, of a pattern which increases and cr increases and culminates uh, in uh, the decline and the eventual collapse of the Venetian Republic in 1797. Now the 18th century is perhaps visually uh, the period in which most non-Italians and non-Venetians get their idea of what Venice is about. Um, and this is the start of the period when Venice economically uh, was really uh, in a noticeable decline. It wasn't quite out yet. It hadn't completely collapsed, but things were certainly nowhere near as good uh, as they had been in the previous uh, centuries. But it's also the time when there's sort of new changes in travel and particularly the Grand Tour. Uh, where European aristocrats travelled to Italy ostensibly to uh, find uh, traces of the ancient Roman and, uh, to a lesser extent, the ancient Greek past. Uh, but those grand tourists all seem to pass through Venice and uh, spend considerable amounts of time in what was by now a very famous city. Uh, Venice had a six-month uh, long carnival. Of course, the reasons that many of these people came uh, to Venice in this particular time on their grand tour was uh, the same reasons that young travellers today like to get away from their home context. It was to have fun away from them, prying eyes of family or the village uh, or any, anything like that. And so Venice becomes associated at this particular time uh, as, as a rather decadent place, as a place that uh, really had uh, its day was done. Uh, it, it was you know, a somewhat redundant place and, and that the, the Venetian nobility, Venetian society was a rather sort of puffed up uh, remnant of, of, of lost uh, glory. And so that's, that's an image, that one of decay uh, and perhaps uselessness, uh, which uh, has persisted right uh, through to this day. And visually the, the Rococo style, the gilded uh, floral um, style and florid style of that period is one which people think of as being prototypically a la Veneziana in the Venetian uh, style. 
Now, a lot of people, when they're accounting for the politics of Venice with the collapse of the um, Venetian Republic in 1797, see that as the end of Venice's um, history or the end of anything noteworthy about Venice's history. Um, I'd certainly suggest to you that uh, to look a bit further uh, than that. So what happens after, in fact, it's Napoleon uh, who forces uh, the Republic to vote itself out of existence after Napoleon uh, comes uh, to the city uh, in 1797. He very quickly does a deal and it's handed over to the Austrians. And it remains um, a southern province, if you like, of, um, of, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire right through to 1866. Now, that's uh, an interesting period, uh, that early uh, Austrian period. The railway comes to Venice. Uh, mass tourism begins to arrive. Venice transforms itself. It's no longer a proud independent republic. It's a colony, if you like, um, of, 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 of the Austrians. Uh, it invents itself um, as a holiday destination uh, uh, initially. In 1866, uh, it uh, joins uh, the uh, unified uh, Republic of Italy, of course. So look, I've moved on uh, to the next slide, a little bit by accident, but that tells me uh, to move on uh, now um, to talk about um, in a, a little bit of detail and with some visual images, each of those uh, seven periods. And that's what I'll be doing um, for the rest of this talk. So firstly, just as I mentioned, going for a trip out on the lagoon is a great way to give you an idea of some of these early settlements. So what we're looking today is um, just a photograph of a farmhouse uh, on one of the smaller islands uh, in the northern part of the lagoon with some sort of uh, fish uh, leases that you can see there in embankments. These low islands or barene as they are known, B-A-R-E-N-E -E, in Venetian dialect, are the sort of prototypical landform of uh, the lagoon. They're sandbanks. Uh, they, because the water is brackish, it's partly salt water from the sea, but a lot of it is river water. Uh, the sand actually drained the water. And uh, if you dug down in the middle of these barene, you could have drinkable uh, water. That was an important uh, resource for people who moved uh, to the area. But you can see still to this very day um, remnants uh, of what was a much older sort of pattern uh, of civilization. So we're looking now uh, at, at a slide of something which looks a little bit like perhaps what some of the early uh, prehistorical habitations would look like. Um, the general term that's used to describe this civilization by archaeologists is a palla fita. A palla is like a pile or a, a, a wooden post uh, that's uh, put, as you can see, through the water and into the mud. These were often uh, pieces of timber which had come from the forests and the hills to the north of Venice. Uh, there, which had been taken down four to six metres uh, into the mud. Uh, they were they are hammered down and a number of these then provided a foundation which allowed people to live next to the land on top of the water. And it gave them the, the agricultural resources and the commercial resources of both the sea uh, and the land. So believe it or not, we have evidence from very early in Venice's history of farming um, taking place, but of course, uh, fishing and as you might expect, um, people moving around uh, by boat. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, most of the Veneto uh, actually had uh, a landscape like this, not just the area of the Venetian lagoon. And right inland, as, inland as far as uh, Vicenza and other provincial cities around Padua and things like that, there are still um, small lakes and people have recreated uh, for archaeological or sometimes for tourism reasons, are uh, these early Palafita dwellings. And this is a kind of a, a hotel, a, a sort of a, a glamping um, place just out of Treviso where you can stay the night and imagine that you are living uh, in, in the Bronze Age. Um, given the swampy uh, terrain, uh, which was frequently impassable by land, uh, in any case isolated um, on, on islands, um, water and moving around on water, of course, becomes uh, the way of moving about. So right from before history, you know, um, a very unique uh, way of living, one, living one's life and a unique relationship with the brackish water of the lagoon, which of course later comes to characterise um, Venice and things which are typical Venetians. We, we might extol gondolas today and, um, you know, those age old traditions. I guess with a slide like this, I'm trying to point out that they go um, a lot further back uh, than that. Um, we know that this continued uh, right through into recorded history because we have documentations of it. So this beautiful photograph um, shows the, the lagoon in wintertime and one of these fishing huts that still exists uh, to this day. You can see a modern uh, fishing boat. It's not used as a permanent dwelling, but it will be used 
during the fishing season uh, by one of the people, one of the 1500 people who have fishing licenses for the lagoon uh, as, as a base when, when, when the fish are running. And we have a beautiful um, description by Cassiodorus, who was a Roman senator, a late Roman senator writing in the sixth century, who came, um, you know, as, as wealthy Romans could do to the lagoon for a holiday. And he described uh, the inhabitants uh, in a rather patronizing way. Uh, but was struck um, by the uniqueness of their life going right back. This is going right back to the sixth century. He describes the houses as being like, like aquatic birds, now on sea, now on land, with the boats hitched like animals um, to the walls. That becomes an enduring sort of image, which is reproduced countless times uh, in the art of Venice when they're extolling um, the characteristics of, of the city. We'll look at that um, in the talk about the legends uh, of St. Mark. The fact that the lagoon has a very long history, which goes right back um, before what we know as recorded history, can be found um, in some of the archaeological finds around the lagoon. One of my favourite places is to go to this small building, which you can see in the top left slide there. This is on the island of Torcello, which most people go to to see the very beautiful mosaics, which are in the um, 6th century um, basilica, the 11th century mosaics in the 6th century basilica, which is behind uh, the archaeological museum. You go up those stairs, though, and you've got ancient finds from the lagoon. Uh, these are from the islands of the lagoon and the ancient or the archaeological sites that are on the edge of the lagoon. And it's an incredible um, array. We've got Egyptian, we've got Etruscan, uh, we've got um, Minoan and Mycenaean uh, works, uh, as well as sort of more standard Greek uh, and Roman finds as well. What this tells us was, uh, firstly, there was a, a society here, people living here, who were active in trade. They were producing enough things, probably salted fish uh, would have been one of the things, or salt, in fact, from the salt pans. Uh, uh, and they were importing uh, luxury goods uh, from other civilizations uh, around uh, the Mediterranean basin. So far from being sort of empty or undiscovered uh, before these communities arrived in the sixth or seventh century, the Venetian lagoon in Venice uh, was, if not a hive of activity, certainly a, a place where uh, human civilization had left uh, its, its mark. But uh, let's move now to sort of this first significant period. And I, I mentioned uh, in my introduction that this is in a way sort of uh, the dream time of Venice. Uh, and the first thing to point out, and this map does it beautifully well, is that the city of Venice was not the dominant settlement that we know it, uh, know it as. Uh, today, in fact, the lagoon uh, or the, the sort of province of Venetia, uh, as it was called by the Byzantines who, who governed it, and I'll talk more about that in a second, uh, comprised a dozen uh, at least um, localities. And indeed, the, the early uh, sort of legends of Venice uh, talk about the 12 tribunes or the 12 heads of the 12 communities uh, on the lagoon uh, getting together. Uh, um, uh, and to elect their first leader, the Doge. Um, so that tells us there were, there were at least 12, but probably many more uh, communities. Some of them, if you look closely, uh, you'll know of. So you've heard of places like Torcello, which once had a population of 20,000, and you might have visited uh, Burano and uh, Murano, and you might have gone out to the Lido. And in fact, on the Lido, uh, about halfway down the island, uh, a fair way from where you got off the ferry, there's a charming uh, little medieval village called Malamocco, which was thought to be the first uh, capital uh, of, of the island. Um, the Rialtina Islands, or as they were referred to, or as historians uh, uh, refer to, the High Bank, um, became eventually, as I said, one of those settlements, uh, the Rialto. Uh, and the watercourse that ran uh, around those islands was a former river. So what was the Grand Canal is thought to have been uh, a drowned river. So uh, the um, area was, you know, sort of the idea of Venice at that time was much more than just the city that we know uh, at the time. Now, you'll see that term there uh, in the middle of the map describing Venetia as being a dogado. What does that mean? Um, it means that it was a territory, a province of Byzantium, which was ruled over by a dux, who was a military chief. So this was a military province of the Eastern Roman or the Byzantine uh, Empire. Now, um, well, I'll talk more about this in, in the next slide, but uh, it was at the extreme end uh, of, of that area, and it certainly wasn't Venice, the city uh, that we know of today. 
So this map um, then expands, pulls out the focus, if you like, and what we're looking at here uh, is the Byzantine Empire, which changes, of course, uh, its shape. So the Roman Empire uh, in, in the fourth century splits into two, the Roman Empire of the West, based around Rome uh, as its capital uh, and city, and then Constantinople, the city founded by Constant, um, um, Constantine in, in the fourth century, becomes the head city uh, of uh, the Empire of the East. Now, after Rome in the West collapses, after the Roman Empire collapses in Western Europe, of course, the Byzantine or the uh, Roman Empire in the East persists for another thousand years until 1453. Uh, and uh, the emperors uh, who are Greek speaking by the stage and eventually sort of practice a different uh, right to the Roman Catholic right. Uh, that happens uh, a bit later. Uh, they're ruling vast territories, which we would uh, today call uh, Asia Minor or Turkey, which you can see there on the right hand side. Uh, and then uh, the broad area uh, of the Balkans uh, uh, and Greece that we can see, southern Italy and at the extreme end of their empire, if you look at the top left um, of the map, you can see a little black line going around Venice and going around some bits of what we call Croatia today, the Istrian Peninsula, uh, and they were Byzantine protectorates. They were the boondocks, if you like, of the Byzantine Empire. So Venice starts off <laughs> as absolutely not the centre um, of, of an empire, but the extreme outer point. Why are the Byzantines sort of wanting to control it? Well, partly it's military to stop any incursions on, on their empire proper, but also partly it's for trade. And so the Byzantines establish an emporion or a, a trade depot here uh, for goods which have come uh, from what was, after all, the capital of, uh, of empire at the large city of Constantinople with all the resources and the things that could be produced uh, which couldn't be produced at that particular time during the Dark Ages uh, in, in Western Europe. So in order to secure that far border, um, you needed some level of administration and some level of military uh, control and the Dux, um, who is a Byzantine um, figure. This is important, of course, because the, the Dux is the forerunner of the Doge. And now it's ironic that, uh, you know, the Venetians very much see the Doge as their own. They see the Doge as a, the result of an almost spontaneous um, election from uh, the Lagoon communities. The actual history, of course, um, is a little more complicated uh, than that, but it has its origins uh, in this particular period. I mentioned uh, that the Byzantines came uh, or set up Venice uh, and its settlements um, for, as emporion, uh, as, as, as trade. Um, the Venetians themselves, uh, though, played an important role in, in the furtherance of that trade. So if Byzantium controlled the trade routes and the movement of goods all the way to the extreme end of their uh, empire, it was the Venetians who, during these centuries from the 7th to the 11th centuries in particular, get absolute control of the river trade. Uh, now, the movement of goods, um, the safest way to move goods and the, the most efficient way was to move them um, on water. And of course, you have the Po River, this 400 kilometre long river, which moves um, across the top of northern Italy. And at the city of Pavia, um, which you can see uh, there on the left of the map, this was one of the capital cities of the Lombards, uh, who were a group of people who would moved in uh, to northern Italy. And they were major trading partners um, for the Byzantines. And it's the Venetians who moved uh, goods up and down the river. So Venice's famous maritime commercial skills are first developed uh, in the river trade uh, in, uh, in, in, in these early uh, centuries. Uh, Venice learned something else apart from just trading skills. It also had to participate militarily. So one of the things that we see in the ninth century is a potential commercial rival Comacchio, which was aligned uh, to the Lombards and then the Franks, the, the people who controlled the lands uh, of, of northern Italy, uh, the Venetians knock out, literally burn to the ground Comacchio uh, in the ninth century. So they're not just using treaties and better prices and, and things like that in order to control. They're not uh, against or not uh, at all opposed to the idea of using military conquest 
as a way of ensuring economic and permanent economic advantage. So before they venture out into the Mediterranean, which they uh, begin to do in the 11th century, uh, in this early period, they've got control uh, over, uh, over that river trade. And that in itself is a really uh, interesting sub-story uh, in, in, in Venice's history. Now, as I mentioned, we don't really see much of this period walking around the city uh, to, to today. You have to go, uh, if you actually want to see material evidence, you have to go to outlying places such as the island of Torcello, which is largely uh, uninhabited today. It's only got a few families who live there and a few lovely restaurants and things like that. Uh, but as you can see, there's been some serious uh, archaeological work uh, undertaken there, and that has found uh, dwellings uh, from, from this period, such as this ninth uh, century site, which shows a you know, quite sophisticated uh, settlement, we believe a farm settlement with uh, houses which are made of a combination of timber and thatch, but with um, stone basins. They're not unlike if you've seen um, Viking um, sites in, in Northern Europe, the, the architecture is, is, is not similar. So you have to go quite um, a long way from the centre of Venice often to see the material evidence. But one thing that I will say that you do encounter almost on a daily basis from this period is the classic urban form of Venice of the square or the campo, as they call it, a field because it did have grass and animals would have been on this field, uh, which will have a well uh, in the middle of it, a well head, um, a parish church uh, on the island and an embankment. Now that kind of pattern, you'll come across squares like that time and time again as you wander through the city. And this is the absolute sort of um, urban or island nucleus uh, of Venice. And this was uh, this was uh, really goes right back to this period where people lived on in, sort of on hundred uh, hundreds of different islands that made up the area uh, around the Rialto. Each one had its own little parish church. Uh, they weren't connected with bridges, of course, um, originally, and so they needed the embankments uh, to get there. So that is a kind of uh, yeah a, a classic Venetian sort of urban uh, pattern uh, that comes from this particular um, period. A few other things um, important uh, in this period, just in terms of historically, I'll mention the year 810. This was when uh, uh, the the Franks, um, the descendants of Charlemagne, uh, the Great, uh, attempted uh, to conquer the city of Venice. They were foiled uh, by the Venetians. Uh, they couldn't get across the lagoon and the sandbanks, but the Venetians decide to move the main city uh, from Malamocco on the Lido to the Rivo Alto. So we can talk about the rise of Venice, the city that we know today as being the principal city of the lagoon. We can certainly uh, put a date on that of about 810. Of course, the Rialto itself uh, goes on to play an absolutely pivotal role um, in Venice's uh, triumph, if you like, its economic triumph in the following centuries. And uh, I'm showing you this uh, image which shows the bridge and then to the right of the bridge near where my head is, uh, on this um, slide, you can see uh, then the market areas resembling very much a Middle Eastern uh, souk. So that area, um, you know, again, uh, goes right back um, um, into the early history uh, of the city. Um, but the other great event uh, that takes place in this early period and is absolutely important, in fact, uh, there's a talk um, entirely uh, just devoted to this subject, is something that's really important if you like in the religious history or the mythology of Venice. And that's, let's shall we call it, the translation uh, of the body of St. Mark from Alexandria to Venice. That word translation uh, is uh, a word that's used by religious scholars uh, to describe uh, the movement uh, of saints' relics uh, um, as if by the will of God. So they're not stolen or removed, uh, they're translated. So you might know the story of the house of the Virgin Mary, which comes flies um, to Loreto in, uh, in Italy. That's a good example of translation. Well, the, the way that the Venetians build up um, the legend of St. Mark and the mythology of St. Mark is to say that it's the will of God that wanted uh, this great relic, uh, one of the four evangelists, to lie in Venice rather than in Alexandria. And so in the year 828, um, two uh, Venetian merchants, who you can see both in the mosaic but also in the painting by Tintoretto uh, on the right, do manage to spirit away uh, the body from Alexandria and it's brought uh, to Venice. Uh, and this begins uh, the great cult of the patron uh, saint of Venice, uh, St. Mark, who comes uh, for the Venetians to rival 
um, Jesus Christ. Uh, so it is an historical event uh, that takes place in the period. It's terrifically important in the mythology of the city and in the city's self-image, giving it almost a religious in imprimatur to become the important city uh, that it becomes. But once again, uh, Venetians, when they're writing their history, put this back uh, into this dream time period, if you like. And so the year 828 is important. The first of the basilicas, the first of the shrines uh, to the saint uh, is erected in 832. And it's about a century and a half later that we see the construction of the magnificent basilica that we see today, one of the prime uh, landmarks, of course, of the city. The next periods I'm going to go through more quickly um, because there'll be separate talks uh, that talk uh, um, about uh, these, this particular period. But the next period I said is this incredibly dynamic period. Um, now we, we think and often people who study particularly the political structure of the Venetian Republic tend to present it in a rather static way. And we forget very often that it was emerging dynamically, very fluidly as Venice um, rapidly expanded and became hugely wealthy um, during this period. So there can be no doubt by the time we get, so, say, to the middle of the 1300s, that Venice is the economically the most dynamic city. Fortunes are being made literally overnight by the trading families. And, you know, we've got generational wealth uh, by this stage, which is being locked in um, to these few hundred families which form the patriciate, the nobility um, of Venice, but are engaged in commerce at the same time. So it's, it's, it's a nobility unlike any other European um, nobility. They engage uh, in all sorts of activities, trade missions, diplomacy, sending out trade convoys, but also, of course, sending out troops participating in the Crusades. And even as this slide shows, even sacking the city of Constantinople, which they do in the Fourth Crusade in the year 1204. Now, the Fourth Crusade is again one of those key events, uh, which I can't possibly recount to you uh, now, but look for a, a subsequent lecture where the, the Fourth Crusade is uh, described in detail. It's a remarkable thing. The Venetians are supposedly acting in the name of the church uh, and the Pope who was approved and the crusade that's been preached. They're going to transport the crusaders who are Northern Europeans on the whole uh, to the Holy Lands, of course, to Jerusalem, to reconquer Jerusalem. The Venetians divert the whole enterprise uh, to Constantinople uh, and they end up sacking uh, the city. The Venetians are very proud of this. This is a painting from the, uh, the Doge's palace, which is presenting it as a moment of triumph of, of, of uh, Venice's absolute um, prowess. I guess later on they've, they've come to be slightly embarrassed by uh, sacking uh, this great city, but certainly not uh, in the, at the time and in the centuries um, afterwards. So Venice then becomes uh, the centre of um, a major uh, trade network. It wasn't the only place, of course, and this map shows you some of the other trade routes. Um, so around the Black Sea to the right, if you see the yellow areas, they were uh, controlled largely by Venice's great rivals, um, Italian rivals, the Genoese. Uh, you had the Catalans from modern day Catalu Catalonia around Barcelona, who controlled much of North Africa and the Western Mediterranean. The Hansa, the Hanseatic League, League based in Lübeck, who controlled the Northern routes uh, and the Baltic. But the Venetians, whose empire is shown uh, in red there, extending down the uh, Croatian coast uh, through the Peloponnese, Crete, uh, and sections of Asia Minor controlling absolutely the way into and out of Constantinople, and of course over to the Levant as well, the Holy Lands, the lands uh, of, 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 of the Crusades. Now looking at this map and thinking about all the clients um, for Venice's trade who are all scattered all over Europe, can you see straight away that um, Venice has got this incredible uh, geographic advantage when it comes to moving goods uh, from the east to the west? It's tucked up in, uh, um, in, in the top end of the Adriatic, you know, a narrow sea which can be controlled militarily fairly easily and much more easily than the Western uh, Mediterranean. Uh, it has alpine crossings very nearby. Um, it's got timber and other resources uh, for shipbuilding. Uh, it's got non-Christian people in the Balkans who can be pinched as slaves and, and sold uh, uh, across the Mediterranean. The Venetians were not against a bit of um, slave trading. Um, but most importantly, and this is uh, what the Venetians do, uh, they bring in um, those goods from their trade routes and very often in their own city, 
uh, through manufacturing processes, they improve those goods, uh, they produce finished products. Venice is actually a great city of manufacturing as well as trade, and then they distribute those goods um, in an almost monopolistic um, fashion uh, throughout um, uh, Western uh, Western Europe. And so it's, it's not just the trade uh, with the East and the domination of those trade routes, but it's all uh, with the East, it's the connections with the West uh, as well that also um, put Venice in such uh, a great position. And again, uh, this is worthy of an, an entire talk, if, 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 not, uh, if not more on its economic history. Of course, with this great change in Venice's status, uh, in this period uh, comes a desire to express that status uh, in various ways. And this is where we see the emergence of you know, this spectacular building boom, which really begins uh, with the construction of St. Mark's Basilica in the 900s. And you can see the five domes there just to the left, uh, the Doge's Palace, again, beginning in the 9th and 10th century and being expanded largely in the 14th century and the 15th century. The, the building that you see today is the 14th and the 15th century. St. Mark's Square, which is originally an orchard, uh, formed uh, with the building of the procurator's offices uh, in, the, in the 1500s. The bell tower um, from the 14th century and the library. So this sort of great monumental space which defined uh, the state. You know, it's it's uh, still a magnificent site to the, uh, to this day. Imagine uh, the status that it gave the city for visitors uh, when they were coming here in the 1300s and 1400s. They would have seen nothing uh, like it in East or West. A truly magnificent expression of statehood, of power and prestige through architecture. And notice that it's a combination of civic and religious architecture, all of it very carefully controlled uh, by the Venetian state. None of this accidentally um, giving rise. We're, we're talking about far more than one Lord's Palace or far more than one parish church when we're talking about uh, the architecture and the urban planning uh, of, of, of the city of Venice. Um, following immediately on from this period of, of boom then uh, is you know, this period of the glorification of the Venetian state, which I have uh, uh, alluded to. Uh, and really, this is characterised, it's, it's more of the same in terms of the grandeur, but it's really a projection of that glory onto Western Europe, and largely because Venice acquires this land uh, empire. So we're looking at an iconic painting, which if you follow my lectures or join me on a tour, uh, you'll probably get sick of me talking about. It's by Gentile Bellini. He was the brother of today the artist who's better known, Giovanni uh, Bellini, the fine portraitist and, and painter of religious paintings. But Gentile Bellini was often employed to create these great sort of paintings depicting the state. Now, this painting, uh, I won't go into the detail, it was uh, made for a confraternity, but the reason I like it is that we see in both human form in terms of people and the procession, but also in terms of architectural form, uh, the full display uh, of the Venetian state. So we've got a procession that's taking place where the people have left uh, the Doge's palace and they're processing around the square. Some people have finished uh, the procession on this is a special day for the people at the front, and they're going to go eventually into St. Mark's uh, Basilica, where there will be a special service, a special mass, uh, which will be held with the Doge in attendance. You'd need very, very good glasses, or you'll have to go to the Academia Galleries and have a look at this painting to see the Doge, uh, who's there just behind the senators and with the with his uh, six procurators uh, there in midway through that um, that long line of people um, there on the right-hand uh, side of the painting. So this is sort of the artistic embodiment of, of the way that Venice was trying to project itself. And indeed, Venice uses art and architecture in very distinct ways, in very interesting ways that make it quite different uh, from other Renaissance art um, to project these images. And we learn a lot, these are social documents. Let's think about the basilica that we see there as the back as being the reliquary, the shrine of the great patron saint uh, of the city uh, with the Doge's palace, just sneaking out there, the, the symbol of Ven uh, Venice's Republican um, authority, uh, the, the, the state uh, made, con made concrete or made stone, and then the people um, which go to make up the polity, uh, they are also depicted in all of the levels with all of their garments and their accoutrements and things like that in the painting. So it's a superb example of, of, of this particular 
the period uh, in Venice's history. Another thing for which Venice is famous, which really become emphasized uh, in this time, uh, is the commemoration of Venetian history and Venetian glory through procession and through ritual. And now this is something that's been studied and written about uh, for a long time, but also documented. I've, I've cheated a bit here. This is an 18th century painting. You'll probably recognize Canaletto uh, as the artist, but it's depicting one of the most important um, festivities in Venice, the Feast of the Ascension or the Festa della Senza, as the Venetians call it. And here you can see the doge's ceremonial barge, the Buccintoro, that beautiful gilded boat uh, that's there on the right in front of the Doge's palace, which will have the Doge and the Senate on board, and they're heading out towards the Lido, towards the entrance to the sea, where the Doge is going to symbolically marry the sea by throwing a large wooden ring into uh, the waters. And then they'll go uh, to the monastery of San Nicolo on the Lido and uh, commemorate uh, with a great banquet um, on this particular event, the Feast of the Ascension. So this is showing, it's, it's remembering hundreds of years of history uh, and showing to the Venetian citizens and anyone else who happens to be visiting, ambassadors and other people who happen to be visiting the city, it's reminding people of Venice's prestige and its, it, 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 its preeminence. It's just one of dozens of ceremonies. Of course, if you visit the city today, you'll see many of these things are uh, remembered the Feast of the Redentore, um, which is a commemoration of Venice surviving the plague in 1576. This takes place in July. A bridge of boats uh, is built across the Judeca Canal. And if you visit the city in this time, you can uh, walk across. There's a great fireworks display. The Festa della Salute, another plague commemoration, takes place uh, in November uh, at that great church. So, so historical regattas, all sorts of things which remember great moments uh, in Venice's history. So Venice is very actively mythologizing itself in this time and using uh, art. The final century um, of, the, of the Republic at the 18th century is a terrifically interesting one, particularly um, if you like music. This is the time, of course, of Vivaldi of the many other great composers. This is when Venetian opera really ruled uh, the, the, the world was the style which was copied um, absolutely everywhere. And this is when, of course, many, many visitors, European aristocrats flock to the city. They stay for months and they want to take away memoirs of their visit. So this is uh, a painting by Canaletto, absolutely made for export. It's a, a very large, very beautiful and very expensive postcard uh, of, of its day. And it's, it's no wonder that so many of these works by Canaletto end up not in Venice. There are very few works by Canaletto in Venice, but end up uh, in royal collections or art galleries or the properties uh, of the aristocracy in Europe, particularly uh, England uh, and uh, Germany uh, at, at this particular time. And it, as I mentioned, it's um, by this stage, you know, Venetian society having developed for all of this uh, centuries has rather ossified into a, a set of rituals which are full of pomp, but don't perhaps have quite so much resonance as they had once upon the time because uh, Venice's territories have really shrunk. Uh, its economic life is much uh, diminished and it's threatened and you know is imminently going to be overrun uh, by Napoleon and uh, his forces. But nevertheless, uh, the, the uniqueness of the city, the remarkable setting and the glorious history, particularly its Republican history, um, is something which is remembered um, by people in this period of the Grand Tour and the European uh, Enlightenment. And of course, this is where we get, you know, the popular images of Venice as a decadent place. So gambling uh, was a popular occupation. Of course, this is something that many foreigners love to do. So this is um, a, a, an image by Pier, uh, Piero, Pietro Longhi, who was one of the great genre or scene painters uh, of, of the day. This is a kind of a commemorative piece, not of a landscape like the Canaletto, but commemorative of social activity. And it's showing the gamblers are uh, wearing their balta, which is their tricorn hat and their white mask so that they couldn't be identified, um, moving around the casino. And you can see playing cards there. You can see members of the Venetian nobility, these people who were formerly senators or great merchants, uh, acting as the bankers, <laughs> the representatives uh, of, of the state ensuring the money uh, was, 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 was coming in there. So this image of a city that was perpetually uh, partying, uh, the Las Vegas, if you like, 
uh, of Europe at the, at the particular time is, is remembered in images uh, uh, such as this, as is the dress style, um, the clothing style, and that uh, highly ornate Rococo um, style. Uh, and again, if you're into music, um, this was where if you were a visitor, uh, you could come to places uh, such as this, which was an orphanage, uh, a female orphanage, and here the putte, the, the terrifically talented uh, female singers or musicians who would entertain you, who would entertain visitors uh, in weekly concerts, in what were the first subscription concerts in music uh, history in these institutions, public concerts where you could buy tickets to the whole series. Um, composers such as Vivaldi and others had to come up with new works every week um, for the concerts. And if you were in Venice for several months, you would make it a ritual by attending these uh, on um, a regular basis. So, so again, another sort of persistent, if you like, image of Venice, which comes from this particular period is, is that of Venice uh, and musical performance and public musical performance rather than private or religious um, musical performance. The end of the Republic at the end, and I'll just mention 1797, um, after a number of skirmishes, Napoleon threatens uh, the destruction of the city and the Venetians choose uh, to extinguish themselves, to vote the Republic out of existence rather than have Napoleon's troops come through uh, and sack uh, the city. They do come into the city and of course they loot uh, many important goods. Napoleon himself doesn't come for another 10 years. He doesn't come until 1807. And to celebrate his arrival, a triumphal arch is built um, across uh, the Grand Canal at the end of the Grand Canal. And here you can see Napoleon's barge emerging uh, through this uh, temporary, the improvised wooden uh, triumphal arch. It's a very incongruous image, but uh, one of typical Napoleonic um, uh, grandeur. As of course I mentioned, uh, Napoleon, although he has a significant impact um, on the city, very quickly palms Venice off uh, to the Austrians, uh, who after Napoleon's demise in 1815 continue uh, to rule. And then finally, um, I won't dwell on this um, for very long at all, but just to talk uh, about the final period uh, in Venice's uh, history, we can see under the Austrians and certainly through to the 20th and the 21st century, Venice does not die, it not, does not become a museum, it invents itself or reinvents itself in a number of very interesting ways. And I've shown you this image uh, of the Lido to show you the beach holiday as being one of the ways. Um, the railway built by the Austrians comes to Venice in 1846. This allows middle class visitors, uh, other Italians, uh, as well as um, Northern Europeans to get to the city. Now, if you're living in Austria, um, for example, in, in, in Vienna, um, Venice, the beautiful city of Venice, is going to be a very appealing place to come for your summer holidays. So these large um, hotels for the middle classes, such as the Grand Hotel de Barn, which you see in the image here, are built on the, on the Lido. And indeed, the word Lido uh, which comes to mean uh, throughout the world, throughout the English speaking world in particular, a kind of holiday um, village is, uh, uh, it first gets its name, of course, from the Lido uh, in Venice. Other kinds of inventions uh, in the 19th and the 20th century, we had the reinvention of Venice with its great artistic heritage as a centre for modern and contemporary art. And this happens largely through the Biennale, of course, and here you're seeing um, one of the iconic works, I think from the 2017, um, Biennale by um, Lorenzo Quinn, uh, the hands that emerge from the canal. So, but it's not just the Biennale. Um, many um, wealthy collectors have based themselves and set them set up their establishments uh, in Venice. And so it's become a place to see the absolute cutting edge. And the, the idea of the Biennale, of course, has expanded not just um, from visual art, but also architecture. Um, in the 1930s, we have um, uh, film uh, which was originally, of course, propaganda, um, but uh, the film industry in, in Italy centers itself around the Venice Film Festival, which is still held uh, in, in this time. So, so that um, glass, modern glass art, which again is an ancient Venetian tradition. So the reinvention uh, of the city as an art city uh, is another uh, one of those things. Uh, perhaps on the negative end of the scale, we also have uh, the reinvention of Venice as a cheap 
weekend destination. And I hope when you visit the city, it's nothing like this horrific city of uh, this horrific photograph, I should say, of what is probably a Sunday afternoon when lots of people decide uh, from the nearby towns uh, to descend on the city. If you've chosen, chosen your itinerary in your time of year, well, you won't have to deal um, with this at all. But uh, yes, uh, the reinvention of the city is a destination uh, for mass tourism is something which is now being actively resisted and uh, thank goodness um, steps are being taken uh, before it all um, uh, is, is too late. So I'll finish uh, the slide with a couple of uh, key dates. There won't be a test on this uh, if you're joining me on a tour, um, but just some key dates to keep in mind. 18, 828, I should say, the theft of the body of St. Mark. 1000, military control of the Adriatic. Venice goes from being a river trader to being a, an ocean trader. 1204, the Fourth Crusade, Venice takes and sacks the city of Constantinople. The Doges declare themselves successors of the Roman empires of the East. 1310, uh, uh, an attempted coup uh, by Biamonte Tiepolo and his supporters sees a complete reformation of uh, the Venetian political structure and particularly the Council of Ten, the much feared Council of Ten, the social security uh, enforces of the Venetian state. 1571, the Battle of Lepanto, this great battle that took place um, in the southern part of the Adriatic. Venetian ships, um, Austrian ships, papal troops are defeating uh, in what was the largest naval battle of all time to that point, some 400 ships temporary halt, temporarily halting the progress uh, of, of the expanding um, Turkish uh, Empire. 1630, the last major outbreak of the plague in Venice and really um, the, and the marking an acceleration in the economic and social decline of the city. Uh, 1797, this tumultuous date where the Republic uh, comes to an end. 1866, uh, becoming part of unified Italy there. So a few dates there uh, to take you through um, all of those um, different periods. And then 1966 and 2019 uh, periods uh, of major floods. And now perhaps uh, the greatest challenge, apart from over tourism for the city, um, is environmental change. So thank you very much um, for tuning in. I hope you have found that uh, an enlightening and interesting uh, introduction, a sweep, if you like, through Venice's history. Other presentations are much shorter and much more modest uh, in this in their scope. Um, perhaps you've taken several um, bites of the cherry and, and listened to this presentation in several times. So thank you for listening, and I hope to join you, or I hope to see you or hear you um, at uh, other sessions in Limelight Arts Travels lecture series.